I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Here I am at a major chamber of commerce function, about to receive an award, and Rhonda, my wife of 10 years, just whispered in my ear that she was going to leave with Gerald, my business partner, for a weekend of sex in Las Vegas immediately after the award ceremony. Are you out of your mind? I asked quietly so as not to be heard by anyone else. Only with lust, she whispered back, for him. Right now, I'm feeling him through his trousers. We need to talk, I told her, but not now. Later, after we get home from the ceremony. No, Ron, I'm telling you how it's going to be, she said. If you want to talk, you can give me some ideas or maybe remind me of the things you've always wanted me to do with you but refused. I'll be home Monday evening and we can talk then, if you still feel the need. This was the start of a three-day weekend and I knew she didn't have to be back to work until Tuesday. And you plotted this with him. I asked quietly, of course, she said. His wife also knows. I looked and saw my soon-to-be ex-partner and friend sitting next to Rhonda with a shit-eating grin on his face. I wanted to punch the son of a witch out, but not here, not in front of all these people, these so-called pillars of the community. I looked at Judy, his wife, who sat next to him. She didn't look too happy at all, apparently. She also knew about this. My mind was racing, but I focused back on the present when I heard my name called by the master of ceremonies. I got up, shook his hand, and accepted the award, holding it for a second as a photographer took a picture. I gave my prepared acceptance speech and noticed as I did that Rhonda's hand was in Gerald's lap. I decided to make an impromptu change in my speech. On my notes, I had included an acknowledgement of my wife, but I ended my speech a bit early, not even mentioning her name. Instead, I thanked the community for their support and the chamber for the award, then ended my speech. I didn't know if anyone would notice the slight, but Rhonda mentioned it after I sat back down. What? Didn't I even rate a mention? She asked sarcastically as I took a sip of my now tepid drink. I simply glared at her, not saying a word. So, that's how it's going to be. Huh. Well, like I said, we'll talk Monday evening when I get back. Gerald got up and headed for the podium, deliberately bumping into me on his way up. If you go through with this, don't bother coming back, I whispered to Rhonda as Gerald spoke. There'll be nothing here for you to come back to. To emphasize the point, I slipped my ring off my finger and handed it to her. She smirked as she dropped it in her purse. Dot dot. You know why I'm doing this? She asked. Of course you do, she added. It's for what you did with Judy. Don't lie. I know all about it. I have pictures, so you'll say or do nothing. Let me do this and we'll talk when I get back. Don't do this, Rondo, I said. Nothing happened between Judy and I except dinner. We can talk about it after the ceremony. Too late, she said. It's going to happen. The tickets have already been bought. The reservations have already been made. I'm going to give Gerald my naked body this weekend. I'm going to let him do whatever he wants to me, and there's nothing you can say or do to stop me. What if I told you he's HIV positive? I asked. She laughed. I wouldn't believe you. You'd say or do just about anything to keep me from going, she said. Don't say I didn't warn you, I told her. I guarantee that if you do this, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Look, just enjoy the weekend without me. Go play golf or something. When I get back, things will go on as before, she said. I couldn't believe the nerve of this woman. No, they won't, Rondo, I told her. We'll see about that, she said. A minute or two later, Gerald returned and took his seat. Rhonda turned to him, and I could see she had placed her hand back in his lap. Disgusted, I turned away from her. Finally, the event was over and we got up to leave. This is your last chance, Rhonda, I said. She and Gerald smirked as they looked at me. We're leaving now, Ron, she said. I may call you, or not. Either way, I'll see you Monday, no hard feelings. Partner, Gerald said, I promise not to damage her too badly for you. We're done, Gerald, I told him calmly, as partners and friends. I don't ever want to see or hear from you again. We'll see about that, partner, he said as he guided Rondo away. I turned and looked at Judy, who had tears falling down her face. Do you need a ride home? I asked her. She shook her head. No, I have an Uber coming for me, 
she said. Thanks for asking anyway. Didn't you tell them that nothing happened between us? I asked that it was just a dinner and a conversation. I try, but they wouldn't listen, she said. Gerald has pictures of us at the restaurant and Rhonda insists it was a prelude to an affair. You know how she can get sometimes, yeah, I knew, all right. Until now, the only complaint I had about Rhonda was her uncanny ability to act on false assumptions. And once she got something in her head, there was almost nothing anyone could do to change her mind. I see, I told her. I'm sorry, Ron, she said. You don't deserve this. I only hope he thought enough to bring condoms. It doesn't matter, I said. Whether he uses a condom or not is immaterial. The fact that she's going to let him screw her is all that matters. No, I'm finished with both of them. What are you going to do? She asked. What I need to. I told her. What about you? I told Gerald if you went through with this I'd divorce him, she said. And that's exactly what I intend to do. This isn't the first time he's cheated on me, but by God, it'll be the last. Good for you, I said. Let me know if there's anything I can do. If you like, I can refer you to a good lawyer. Thanks, Ron, she said. I appreciate that. With that, she left and I followed shortly, making my way back to the car. On the way home, I thought about the last 10 years with Rhonda. We married about five years after Gerald and I went into business together. Gerald introduced me to her after we had been in business together for about four years. By then, he and Judy had been married for three years. Rhonda and I dated, fell in love and got married. Gerald was the best man at our wedding, and I never would have believed he would be capable of doing something like this. I never thought Rhonda would, either. By the time we got married, the business was growing significantly, so my lawyer suggested I have her sign a prenuptial agreement to protect my assets, which included my home and the business. She didn't like it, but she signed it anyway. I made sure the agreement was equitable and included a clause for infidelity. I had a lot to do and not a whole lot of time to get it done. It was still fairly early in the evening when I got home, so I called my lawyer, Jim Simpson, on his cell. Hey, Ron, he said, I thought you and Rhonda would be celebrating your award tonight. What's going on? He listened as I told him what happened earlier in the evening. Oh my God, Ron, I'm so sorry to hear that he said when I finished. You want me to start drawing up papers? Yes, Jim, I said. I want a divorce for adultery based on our prenuptial and I want you to draw up papers dissolving the partnership. When Gerald and I drew up the partnership, we included a clause that said the partnership could be dissolved if one or more of the partners engaged in morally unacceptable behavior that could significantly impact the operation of the business. I felt this certainly fell into that category. Are you sure about that? He asked, yes, I said, absolutely. I want it reorganized as a sole proprietorship, if possible. I know we had talked about incorporating it as a limited liability company before. Maybe this is the time to do that. All right, I'll get the ball rolling on that, Jim said. It's going to take some time, Bo. I know, I said. But I want the partnership dissolved as fast as possible. And I want my losses mitigated as much as possible. Consider it done, my friend, he said. Thanks, I said, ending the call. I knew that under the terms of the agreement, I would have to pay Gerald something to get him out of the company, so the less I had to give him, the better. I knew Jim would come through for me. A couple hours later, I got a call from Rhonda. I just wanted to let you know we we're at the hotel in Vegas, she said. And I'm so ready for a weekend of hot sex. Rhonda, you should know before you do this that Gerald is HIV positive, I said. If you go through with this, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Stop this nonsense and come home right now. If you do, then maybe, and I do mean, maybe, we can fix our marriage. Oh, Ron, she said with a laugh, are you still on that? Get over yourself. This is going to happen. I'm going to let Gerald have sex with me all weekend long dot as much as he wants. In fact, I'm getting aroused just thinking about it. Maybe if you're a good boy I'll give you his sloppy seconds when I get home. Rondo, I'm warning you, I began to say, but she had already ended the call. That was it, I had warned her, but she refused to listen. The rest of my now screwed up weekend was spent exercising Rhonda from my life. 
On Jim's advice, I went to the bank on Saturday morning and took care of things there, paying off her credit card before canceling it. I got three voicemails from Rhonda and a few text messages over the weekend. She was doing her best to get me riled up. Oh yeah, she moaned in one of her voicemails. Gerald is with me right now Ron, it's so much bigger than yours and feels so much better. I've done things with him I've never done for you. Maybe I'll let him get me pregnant, gotta go now, bye now, bye. The other voicemails were very similar, I forwarded all of them to Jim so he could have them as proof of Rhonda's adultery. I also forwarded them to Judy so she could use them in her divorce from Gerald. I called a locksmith and had all of the locks changed on the doors. I wasn't worried about keeping the house, as I had bought it before we got married and the mortgage was in my name only. I tossed all of her clothes and prized possessions into trash bags and crammed them into her car, leaving enough room for her to drive. I pulled the car out of the garage and left it in the driveway. I pulled down all of the photos that included Rhonda. I broke up the large, utting portrait that hung over the fireplace before placing the broken pieces inside to be burned. By the time I was finished, there was no evidence that she had ever been in the place. After listening to her voicemails the next morning, I called her mother and said we need to talk. She invited me over for lunch, so I went. After eating a sandwich, she asked me what was going on, so I told her everything. I even played the voicemails Rhonda had left. By the time I finished, she was inconsolable. That stupid, stupid girl, she said. I can't believe she would do something like this to you. I'm so sorry, Ron. Of course, she can stay here until she gets back on her feet, but I'm going to tan her hide for this. I'm sorry as well, Mom, I told her. I always thought of Rhonda's mother as Mom, especially since my own mother died from a stroke a few years before. She's going to need all the help and support you can give her. Of course, she said, but I'm still going to put her over my knee. I chuckled and gave her a hug. Please stay in touch, Ron, she said as we broke the hug. I promised I would and left. She was still wiping tears from her face when I left. From there, I went to a tavern that served the juiciest burgers and enjoyed one with a couple beers. Jim called me on Monday to say he had the paperwork drawn up, so I went to his office. Everything looked good, so I paid his retainer and left. The papers would be filed with the court the next day, which was Tuesday. Where would you like her served? Jim asked. Preferably at her place of work, I said. She humiliated me in public, so I think it's only fair I return the favor. Okay, he said before I left. I got a couple more voicemails from Rhonda that day, the last one letting me know she was on her way home. I got a good laugh at that dot dot. Gerald dropped her off that evening about 5.30, then took off. Apparently, he was a bit too cowardly to face me after what he had done. I waited and heard her come onto the porch. I heard her trying her keys, but none of them worked. Finally, she rang the doorbell. I ignored it for a few minutes, and she began pounding on the door. Let me in, damn it, she yelled. I got up and walked to the door. I opened it and stepped outside. She looked at me before trying to walk inside, but I stopped her. What are you doing? I live here too. No you don't, I told her, not anymore. You gave up that right when you left Friday night, but I told you I would be back and we could discuss things if you still wanted to, she said. And why is my car in the driveway? Why isn't it in the garage? And what's all that stuff in it? That's all your stuff, Rondo, I said. Like I said, you don't live here anymore. Look, I know you're upset, she said. We can talk about it if you want. I wanted to talk with you on Friday, but you weren't interested, remember? I asked. I practically begged you to listen to me, but you flat out refused and insisted on spending the weekend with Gerald. That's right, she said. Since you screwed his wife, I figure I deserve to get some revenge. And what proof do you have that I had sex with Judy? I asked. Show me. She pulled out her phone and showed me a picture of Judy Ann, I at a table in a restaurant. What's that? She asked dot dot. That's to people talking over dinner, I said. There's no sex in that picture. And nothing happened between Judy Ann, I for that matter. I have never been with another woman since you and I became exclusive. Then why were you having dinner with her? Rhonda asked. Surely you expected something afterward. There you go again, 
making false assumptions, I said. What are you talking about? She asked. That's what I wanted to talk to you about on Friday, but you refused to listen to me. I said, tell me, did Gerald ever use a condom this weekend? Of course not, she said. You know I hate condoms. I see, I said. That's right, she said. I was going to let you clean me, and if you were repentant, I was going to let you have sex with me, but I don't think that's going to happen. So, you were planning to kill me. Then, I said. Her eyes grew wide. Of course not, she said. Where did you get that silly idea from? Do you remember a few months back when he said he wasn't feeling too well? I asked. That was just a few weeks after he returned from a trip back east. Yeah, I remember, she said. I suggested he go see his doctor and get checked out. I told her. He never told me what the doctor said. But Judy learned it he tested positive for HIV. You want to know how she learned about it? I'll tell you. She learned about it because he infected her. She tested positive just recently. That's what we were talking about at dinner that night. At the time he infected her, he didn't know he had it. But he sure as hell knew this last weekend when he was screwing you. I handed her a copy of Gerald's test results Judy had given me the night we had dinner. Rhonda's face turned white and her eyes widened. I even told you on Friday, but you refused to listen. Oh my God, she said, feeling nauseous. You were telling the truth, I'm going to get sick. She doubled over and vomited in the front yard. I stood and watched as she retched several times in the front yard. When she finished, she looked at me, scared. I'm going to die. Aren't I? She asked. I shrugged my shoulders. I'm not a doctor so I don't know. I said. Judy said her doctor told her it's not the death sentence it was a few years ago, but it's still pretty rough. At any rate, I suggest you go see Dr. Barnes first thing in the morning and let him know. Have him run some tests on you. Maybe if he can catch it early enough, he can do something. But I do know that our marriage is dead. Where will I go? She asked, tears falling down her face. Your mother said you can stay with her until you get on your feet. I said dot dot. My mother, you told my mother. She asked, shocked. Yes, I said. She deserves to know the truth, don't you think? I guess, she said. And you'll be served with divorce papers at work sometime this week. I told her, please, no, she said. I don't want a divorce. Can't we work through this? No, I said. We probably could have if you had talked to me on Friday instead of leaving me to spend the weekend with him in Vegas. But you just had to have things your way. You made your bet, Rhonda. Now you get to lie in it. So what were you doing with Judy in that restaurant? She asked, I already told you, talking, I said. She got her test results and wanted to talk to me. She asked if I had any idea, he was positive. Of course I told her the truth, I didn't. I was trying to find a way to help the two of them get through this, but it seems Gerald decided to have her followed. He got those pictures of us in the restaurant. Naturally, when you saw them, you made your usual false assumptions, and here we are, I hope it was all worth it to you. Please, can't you just give me one more chance, she begged. I'm dying here. I've been dying since you walked out on me Friday night, I said. But I love you, she cried. Yeah, right, I thought. Don't you have any love for me at all? Love you, I asked, right now. I don't even like you. Now, get off my lawn. I walked back inside and slammed the door, locking it behind me. I looked through the window and saw her, sobbing as she knelt on the lawn. She looked totally defeated Dan forlorn, but right then, I didn't care. Eventually, she turned and slowly ambled to her car, still crying. As I watched, she backed out of the driveway and drove off, still crying. The next day, I got to the office early, hoping to catch Gerald when he came in. I had already advised security to confiscate his badge when he came in and had a couple security officers waiting by his office. When he arrived, he gave me a smirk but lost it when he saw the officers. What's this all about? He asked. They're here to confiscate your badge and make sure you don't take any company property when you leave. I told him. Leave? He asked. I'm not going anywhere. Wrong answer. I told him. As of today, the partnership is dissolved. You no longer work here. Bullshit. He said. You can't do that. Read the agreement we both signed. I said. 
tossing a copy of it on his desk. I highlighted the appropriate clause. The dissolution of partnership is being filed this morning, and the company is temporarily being reorganized as a sole proprietorship. I'll give you 15 minutes to pack your trash and get off the property before I have you escorted out. Is this all because I screwed your wife over the weekend? He asked. Partly, I said. It's also for deliberately exposing her to HIV, which, I've been told, is a crime in this state. What? He asked. Dot, dot. I saw your test results, I said. Judy showed them to me. That's what we were discussing that day in the restaurant. She told me you infected her as well. I was planning to make you a silent partner so you could keep your medical coverage and still earn an income. But what you did this weekend was beyond the pale. You know you're infected, but you still chose to spend the weekend with Rhonda without informing her. That's illegal in this state. The two of you had this all planned out, except she didn't know you're HIV positive. In my view, what you did violates the terms of our partnership agreement. I had considered giving you a severance package, but in light of your actions, I've changed my mind. Now, get out. You can't do this, he exclaimed. I'll fight you on this. So help me God. I'll start spreading rumors that you've been screwing half the female staff here, threatening their jobs if they don't go along with what you want. Really? I asked. You deliberately slander me in the community for revenge. On top of deliberately infecting my wife with HIV so she co-infect me. Goddamn right, he said. By the time I'm done, you won't have any business at all. I smiled and pulled an audio recorder from my pocket. I hit a button and played our conversation back to him. I think that should add a few million to the lawsuit and help secure a conviction, I said. Not to mention the fact that you made your claim in front of at least two witnesses. Right? I asked, looking at the two security guards, who smiled and nodded their heads. I looked at my watch, you know, I used to think you were my best friend. I also used to think you were quite intelligent. I see now that my initial assessment of you was wrong. You have 10 minutes to pack up and get the hell off my property. I looked at the guards before speaking again. Keep an eye on him. Make sure he doesn't touch his computer and only takes what's his. Yes sir, Mr. Hastings, one of the guards said. Gerald packed his stuff as the security guards washed. On his way out, he stopped by my office dot dot. I'm sorry, Ron, he said. Just go, I said. Get out. After Gerald left, I called a meeting of all employees. It was crowded in the main office, but I felt they deserved to know there would be changes. I told them that Gerald was no longer with the company and the partnership had been dissolved. I assured them that this change wouldn't affect their jobs in the long run, but could cause some short-term disruption. One of the employees asked why Gerald left, but all I would say is that it was a personal matter. The next several weeks were a blur. Rhonda was served with divorce papers at her place of work on Thursday, which prompted a great deal of gossip. Her mother told me she had gone to see the doctor on Tuesday, but it would be a while before she got the results of her tests. Thankfully, Rhonda didn't deluge me with calls or texts. It seems she finally realized that she had made a huge mistake, one that would affect her for the rest of her life. Realizing there would be no reconciliation, she signed the papers. Jim told me the divorce would be final in 90 days. Judy filed for divorce against Gerald on the grounds of adultery. She told me he was living in a motel room that rented by the week until he could find something else. But he had another problem. After Rhonda's visit, Dr. Barnes reported Gerald to the authorities. From what I learn it, the state we live in requires those infected with HIV inform their partners before any sexual activity takes place. Since Rhonda said Gerald never informed her, he could receive up to 20 years in prison. I also learned that this was one of those laws many prosecutors didn't like to enforce, since there was too great a chance of backlash. But the local authorities decided to go after Gerald, based on Rhonda's testimony. A week or so after being kicked out of his house, police showed up at the motel where he was staying and took him into custody. Concerned that he could present a danger to the general population, he was placed in solitary confinement. Gerald's trial became something of a circus. The prosecuting attorney painted him as a cruel, manipulative sob who deliberately set out to infect me, his partner, with the disease by first infecting Rhonda. Rhonda testified, as did I. Judy also testified. The prosecutor also played the audio I captured in my office, putting Gerald in an even worse position. 
It didn't take long for the jury to convict. Disgusted by what he heard, the judge sentenced him to the maximum allowable by law, 20 years in the state penitentiary. But Gerald's problems were far from over. Now he was in the middle of a divorce as well as civil litigation. After Judy's divorce was finalized, she sold her home when moved out of the area. Rhonda contacted me a few days before our divorce was final and asked me if I would have dinner with her. After thinking about it, I agreed. I felt it was time for closure. We met at a quiet restaurant where we enjoyed a final meal. I hope you're not too scared or ashamed to be seen with me, she said. We're not going to be swapping any bodily fluids, so it shouldn't be a problem, I told her half-jokingly. Dot dot. I got the results of my test, she said. I'm positive. I'm not surprised but I am sorry to hear that, I told her. It's not your fault, she said. You tried to warn me, but I wouldn't listen. It's a mistake I'll be paying for the rest of my life. So, what is the doctor doing, I asked. He's got me on an antiretroviral therapy, she said. It'll never be cured, but he tells me I can live a fairly normal life if I take the drug every day. Of course, I had to let my boss know. He's letting me telecommute so I can work from home, and mom says I can stay with her as long as I need to. That's good to hear, I said. My lawyer is also filing a lawsuit against Gerald, she said. I've been told it's pretty much a slam dunk with his conviction, but collecting may be an issue with him being in prison and all. I see, I told her. Well, I happen to know that his for a 1k was pretty substantial, even after subtracting Judy's portion. She also sold their house, so maybe you can get his half of that. Have you spoken with her recently? I have, she said. She's out of the area, but we still talk from time to time. I'll mention that to her and see what she says. What happened to you, Rhonda? I asked after a while. I don't get it. I wanted to have kids with you, spend the rest of my life with you. I don't know, she said quietly. When Gerald showed me those pictures of you with Judy, I lost it. I just knew you were having sex with her. I really jumped a shark on that didn't I? Just a bit, I said. But why didn't you just talk to me? I was angry, she said. I didn't want to hear anything you had to say. Judy tried to warn me as well, but I figured she was in cahoots with you and would say anything to stop me. I even told you that Friday about Gerald, I said. Twice. I hoped you would have gotten the hint. Frankly, I didn't want to hear anything you had to say, she told me. And now, I'm paying the price, I'll be paying it for the rest of my life. Can you ever forgive me for being so stupid? I don't know. I said. Right now. It's all I can do to be civil around you. I thank you for that, at least, she said. I know it's probably not easy for you. So, how are you holding up? I manage. I told her. I stay pretty busy with the business. Now that Gerald is gone, my workload has doubled. So there's no shortage of things to do. Any women in your life? She asked. No. I said. I'm not in the market for a relationship. Probably won't be for quite a while. Once bitten, twice shy. You know. I'm sorry. She said. I've learned a thing or to myself from all of this. I said. What's that? She asked. Never trust anyone. I said. She looked at me. Shocked. I knew Gerald for years before I met you. That is, I thought I knew him. I had no idea. He was capable of doing what he did. And the things I learned about him during their divorce frankly makes me sick to my stomach. And what you did certainly didn't help. I'm sorry, she said dot dot. Yeah. Well, it is what it is, I said. I see you're still wearing your rings, I added, looking at her left hand. We're still technically married, she said, at least for a few more days. If you want them back you can have them, but I was hoping you'd let me keep them. I don't want them, I said, I'd just take them down and sell them anyway. Why would you want them, as a reminder, she said, of what I once had and threw away. They're yours, I said, do with them what you want. Thank you, she said quietly, a tear falling down her cheek. I'd better get going now, I said, I have a lot to do yet tonight. Tell your mother I said hello and good luck, I will, she said. And thanks, Ron. I really am sorry about all this, yeah, I said as I stood. Me too, Rondo. Goodbye. I could hear her sobbing as I left. 
I wasn't as angry as I was when this all first went down, but I still felt sad. It's not easy ending a decade-long relationship with someone you thought you'd spend the rest of your life with. Work went on as normal and within a year, things had settled down to a steady roar. I had plenty of opportunities, but chose not to date or pursue a relationship. I still had some serious trust issues after what Rhonda and Gerald had done. For me, life consisted of working, eating and sleeping. I had no social life whatsoever. A year and a half after my divorce, niece, my secretary, introduced me to her younger sister, Angela, at a company event. She was a couple years younger than me and had just gotten through a divorce from her husband, who left her for another woman. We began dating, taking things one step at a time, slowly. Both of us had been burned by our previous spouses and still had some trust issues, but as we spent more time together, our trust in each other grew. We dated several times over the course of a month before we ended up spending the night together in my bed. A few months later, I popped the question and she said yes. Our wedding is set for the spring, to be followed up with a five-day Caribbean cruise. We extended an invitation to Rhonda's mother, but we don't know if she plans to attend. I'm still hurting from what Rhonda and Gerald did, but Angela has done a superb job in healing the scars. I've done my best to help her heal as well and I'm certainly looking forward to spending the rest of my life with her. Thinking about Angela, I'm often reminded of the old saw that says, sometimes the bad things that happen in our lives put us directly on the path to the best things that will ever happen to us. Subscribe to the channel if you like this story so you don't miss out on the next one. Thank you.